كما قام بإعداد دورة في كويزلاند عن المباني الشاهقة حصل على بكالوريوس في إدارة الطوارئ من جامعة شارلز ستارت وفي السنوات الأخيرة تم تعيين جيستن كممثل أستراليا لشبكة السلامة في المباني الشاهقة وعين أخير كخبير في حرائق المباني الشاهقة فلتفضل السيد جيستن إلى المنصة بليز جيستن ميك يور واي تو ذا ستيج Hello, thank you for the invite today. So, tall building firefighting, I'm going to give you a bit of an Australian perspective today. Um, so, I come from Brisbane, Queensland in Australia, so you'll notice over on the little slide there, Brisbane's situated about a thousand kilometres north of Sydney. Everybody seems to know where Sydney is. Um, we're quite a, um, it's quite a prosperous little city and it's growing qu quite rapidly. Um, I have about 20 years experience as an operational firefighter. Um, so, and that um, goes across a range of areas. So in particular, building approvals. So I've worked um, within approving building fire systems and what I've done is bring a lot of that knowledge back to operational firefighters. I've also worked with compliance and prosecution. So prosecuting different building fire safety breaches. I'm involved in USAR, so urban search and rescue to do with earthquake response. Swift water rescue, um, bushfire behaviour analyst. So I go away to bushfires and predict where they're, going to, where they're going to spread and what communities they're going to affect. So you can see from that list there, we have to be multi-skilled. And it's um, quite a challenge to actually maintain those skills. Um, in Queensland, we have 241 urban fire services, uh, fire stations, and 1,450 rural fire services. So it's quite a lot of fire stations spread over a very large area. You can see there it um, protects four and a half million people and across one, over 1.7 million kilometres. So it's a huge area, seven times the size of Great Britain. So you think you have challenges in Great Britain, you try and manage <laughs> that sort of area, it's quite difficult. Um, actually that um, particular incident down on the bottom here is a backpacker fire that happened um, about 12 years ago. 16 um, backpackers unfortunately lost their life in that building and that prompted a lot of changes in our legislation. And now we're, pro we're extremely strict about any sort of budget accommodation and how, how th the types of fire systems that have to be in those buildings. And the other big threat we have where I live is um, cyclones. So every year I go away, I get deployed into a cyclone area and that's quite scary actually waiting for a cyclone to hit when it's a category five storm. So it's a bit of a different experience. Um, our big role now, however, is we actually rescue more people out of water than what we do out of structure fires. So most of our firefighters now are trained up quite heavily in um, swift water rescue and that's become a big role. So what I'm gonna to do today is give you an overview over Australian tour building development look at some case studies. So we have two significant events, Cathedral Place and Docklands. And um, we're gonna look at a training course that we've now implemented to help firefighters understand fire systems in tall buildings. A brief look at our, um, our procedures um, for our fire service for high rise. And what are some of the challenges that are gonna be facing people in this room going into the future? What sort of international trends are occurring with tall buildings? And what are some of the common failings that we're actually experiencing with um, some of these fire systems? So this is where I live in Brisbane. You can see there's quite significant um, high-rise growth in that, particular, in that particular city. One of the areas that we have more concern about is these types of buildings over here um, that are under 25 metres of height. Um, under 25 metres is the cutoff. is basically they don't need sprinklers, they don't need stairwell pressurisation, they only need a single staircase, so very minimal fire systems in those types of buildings. Um, whereas when we start getting up into these types of buildings, they're going to have all the fire systems in them. Um, that's on the Gold Coast, and that's um, Q1, and that's um, the tallest building in Australia at the moment. And this particular building is currently planned in Sydney called Aspire Tower, and that's due to be the next highest building in um, Australia very soon. Interestingly, that's actually located 25 kilometres out of the city. So we're now starting to see buildings of significant size even get built outside of um, the large central business district areas. So tall building development. We have two rules. So the National Construction Code or the Building Code of Australia is what you need to comply with. 
as well as, as Australian standards. Very difficult to build tall buildings without having fire engineered solutions. So a lot of those buildings then start to go outside those boundaries and that's where our fire service gets involved actually approving these alternate solutions. Um, a lot of our high rise development is located around the coast of Australia, so in places like Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, Gold Coast and Perth. But there's significant medium rise development happening all the way across the country. And they're those buildings that I'm talking about under 25 metres. Um, as a fire service, we have a very close relationship with the building industry. Um, we actually advise private certifiers when they're actually approving buildings. And um, we're actually involved in actually um, doing the testing of the fire systems before a building's brought online. So we actually carry a lot of power within the industry. We're actually the only independent person involved in the whole building industry. So the private certifier gets paid by the developer, I get paid by my organisation. So we're the last person who's involved in, in that building. So whether I approve or don't approve a fire system, my pay doesn't get affected by that. So we're actually we're quite powerful in that particular area. Um, that particular role is called a building approval officer. So my concern is I question whether fire services are actually keeping up with fire safety um, systems and whether they're actually keeping up with the complexities of these types of structures that we see outside this window. So how are fire services expected to develop strategies and tactics at a tall building when you don't understand the fire safety system in that building? It's all, it has to be factored in. And that's where I've come in um, with my fire service trying to teach our firefighters how these systems actually work. So at 2 a.m. in the morning, a firefighter arrives, meets a fire engineered alternative solution building, 4,000 people evacuating. That is not the time to be working out what that fire system is going to be going to be doing. So to have a look at a case study, this particular event occurred back in 2013 and it was quite significant for my fire service. Um, it was called Cathedral Place and it happened on the fifth storey. So it's one of these under 25 metre high buildings, so it's not sprinklered. Um, it's, a complex, it's a large complex that has over 500 units and up to 10 floors in height. And once again, located very close to a fire station. Um, this is a picture of Cathedral Place. So you can see there, as far as fire compartmentation, can you tell me which fire compartment is actually involved there? It's very difficult to even determine where the fire is actually located. And that's what the crews were faced with when they arrived. I'll just play this Blaze video. Blaze that threatened the lives of more than 1,000 people. Police and fire investigators back in the corner unit where it all began. There's a lot of fire damage in the unit. By midday, authorities had ruled out suspicious circumstances. Firefighters are still investigating whether a candle left burning was the cause. Cathedral Place, an inner city apartment block wedged between the valley and CBD. This is where it started, the fifth floor, Block H. Within minutes, the flames tore through the roof's insulation, spreading to neighbouring units. Eight were destroyed. Dozens more on lower levels have been damaged by smoke and water. So what has failed in that particular building, and that's where I came on board to actually look at what the failings are, were of the building fire systems, the passive fire systems. Why did three people have to, they were located out on this balcony and they were looking at jumping. So that, was, that raised some concern to our organisation as to what, what is going on in this, in this area. And that, if you look up there, that's around the area where the three people were rescued and the fire actually started down the other end of the building. And it pretty much, it, it got through a fire rated ceiling um, where the fire rated ceiling joined a fire rated wall and it went straight up into the ceiling space, into the roof space and spread all the way across the top of the building. And this is the second time recently we've had this same event. Um, you can see here very early on in the fire what was happening here. So we've got the fires located in there. So it was only a candle onto a bedside table. So quite a small event. If this fire had started down here, that's all that would have happened. It would have been a single compartment. But as it started on the top floor, it got up into that fire rated ceiling and spread um, the whole way across the building. Um, thankfully, it did not get past this firewall here. And this was two minutes later. So you can see the fire's taken off quite quickly. And by the amount of smoke that's already showing up the top there, we have quite an active fire now in a second fire compartment. 
And would the firefighters know that at the time? No. It's like you're inside a stairwell. How are you going to know what's happening up in that roof space? And this is a picture of our aerial appliance rescuing the people from that balcony. The, the people inside that particular room were serial ignorers of the evacuation system. So they had actually asked the management, could they be text messaged to tell them if they ever need to evacuate? So, so there's, you know, they obviously assume some responsibility there. Um, and there's a shot of the amount of smoke that was located. Very difficult to even see what's actually occurring, what's on fire. And just looking down onto the top of the building, this is where the, the, area, the unit of origin was. But very quickly, we had a fire that spread throughout that whole top section. Um, we looked at um, the smoke alarms. So these smoke alarms were all out of, out of test date. So they were about 15 years old. Had, did we have smoke penetrate through light fittings? Is that why we had this event? Did the um, damp, dampeners in the um, bathroom, um, bathroom areas, did they fail? But it was actually the join up, up against these firewalls. And you can see the amount of damage and the amount of heat that was involved up in that roof space. And that particular unit is located about 15 metres away from where the fire actually was. And that's the unit that was involved. So obviously not a lot, of, not a lot remains. Um, you can see that's the big firewall that joins the separating unit and that's where the fire rated ceiling. So the fire actually started up against that wall so it spread quite quickly up onto the join and straight into that roof space. So what do we look at? So we've had a, a failure of one single fire safety feature being a fire rated ceiling and that's what we ended up with, an $8.8 .8 million loss. We have limited access for our aerial appliances to even rescue those people. 50% of that building, we would not have been able to rescue them. We would have had to look at either possibly bringing them back through the fire floor. Evacuation complacency. Why are people not evacuating? So that's a common, a common occurrence. And the other one is firefighters, actually their knowledge on these fire safety systems and making sure that now when they turn up at that building, they know what's going to be on site. The next um, incident I'd like to discuss is Docklands down in Melbourne, and this is very topical for yourself in Dubai. Um, Docklands was an external fire spread event. Um, in the last 18 months around the world, we've had more than 10 major fires with external fire spread. Two years ago, we were barely even looking at this as an issue, and now obviously it's become topical. And you'll notice this is where the fire spread, very similar to what you've experienced here, Within two minutes, we've got significant fire spread up the entire side of the building. 23 storeys in height, so above 25 metres, so the building's sprinkled. Um, the evacuation system on this particular building failed very quickly. It actually got into the wiring and um, damaged the evacuation system, but 500 people evacuated very successfully and there were no deaths or injuries. They had recently practiced this evacuation, so that possibly assisted them to get out of the building. Um, but there was a common issue with overcrowding. So some of these apartments had 10 people living in them. So what do you do when you have 10 people living in an apartment? Where do you put your belongings? Out on the balcony. So the balconies were chock-a-block with people's belongings. So big fuel loads out on the balconies. No sprinklers on the balconies. And the external fire spread was um, these, these aluminium composite panels. This particular one, known as a Luca Best, was what helped um, with this fire spread. This um, external fire spread is not very common. To, look, at the fire service that arrived at this particular incident had not ever experienced this before. So procedurally, we, we actually don't even have a procedure in how to fight this type of fire. And this was a, a $5 million loss. So once again, another a big loss um, for an incident. One of the important parts about the footage is you can still see pretty clearly that uh, there's a range of items stored on the balconies and, uh, and one of the issues identified in the fire was that there was um, uh, quite a bit of um, uh, material stored on the balconies and, and when we had the fire there it did contribute to the fire spread. The, the fire started on, uh, on level 8 and, uh, and the fire was actually caused by um, discarded smoking materials. Uh, a table caught fire and then the, the fire consumed a range of other items on the balcony including some vacuum cleaners and some other material and spread up the, um, the combustible cladding uh, quite quickly and within about 10 minutes it had spread up the, uh, the cladding all the way to the roof of the building. 
Uh, look, in, in terms of, um, of the number of occupants, we know that in the lacrosse building that there was um, at least eight occupants in some two-bedroom apartments and maybe as many as 14. Our major concern around that is not so much the number of people that might be there, although that can be a bit concern. It's, people have their own belongings and, um, and, and it's, it's the issue of fire load for us and where people are storing their belongings is probably of a, a more serious concern. So if people are storing things on balconies or in, in, uh, in pathways and those sorts of things, that's gonna be more concerning to us. Okay, so you can see that continuity of that panelling was the major issue there. Had it been broken up by some spacing within it, it actually wouldn't have spread the entire um, height of that building. And you can see there, that's where the panelling was, and it obviously allowed the fire to spread straight up to the next level. So 26 sprinkler heads activated at this particular incident. The sprinkler system's designed for four. Two hydrants were designed for this building, but obviously there were multiple internal hydrants that the firefighters had to use. There was more of an aggressive attack that was required on level 10 and 19, possibly because that was at the top of these sprinkler zones. Most of the people evacuated very well. They were very compliant and they actually left the scene because they were a lot of um, possibly people who maybe weren't even allowed to be living in our country. So they were quite cautious about being found out. So they took off and then um, the government introduced a $500 rebate scheme to assist people with what's happened. They returned. So it was... <laughs> It was quite a clever way of... So if you're struggling with your evacuations, I recommend put some money on the table and people will return. Um, one of the other issues was the fire collars that were fitted to some of the pipe work also didn't function properly. So the important thing from here is, as a government now, so the Australian government's actually done a full Senate, is doing a Senate inquiry into these imported building products. Um, and I, I would recommend, if you're interested in this subject, having a look at the Victorian Building Authority External Wall Cladding Audit Report, which has just been released recently in February. And that, what they've actually done is an audit on 170 buildings. They've gone around Melbourne and looked at which buildings have aluminium composite panels on them. And 51% of these buildings failed. Okay, so 2% require immediate action. And who is at fault over this particular instance where we've got these imported building products that are said to be meeting a standard, but they actually haven't met any standard. They're actually filled with a plastic internal area. Um, so there's been no blame put on one individual, but architects, designers, engineers, building surveyors, builders, they're not always able um, to understand what the actual product is that they're putting on the building. Um, so what's happened from here, it's resulted in a review on the building codes in Victoria sprinkler protection to include, be included on all covered balconies and there's now a national senate inquiry into those non-conforming building products. So I think Australia is quite an interesting place for you to be watching over the next one to two years to see what sort of reaction we, we are going to, how we're we going to deal with this product. So you can see from those case studies minor failings are resulting in major incidents. These were small fires, a candle on a balcony, a candle next to a bedside table that should have been contained, but they turn into late major events. So what do firefighters need to know to deal with these? And that's where we've now implemented a training course called Firefighting in the Built Environment. And what it's aiming to do is teach firefighters on fire systems and how they work. I know that five, 10 years ago, I turned up at these same types of incidents and I didn't really understand those systems. What we now do is take them through and actually show them how they're going to operate. Half of the day is spent in a classroom and the other half we actually go through buildings. We actually operate sprinkler heads and it's a fantastic course. It's been really well um, recognised within my service. And we also look at um, different fire phenomena: wind-driven fires, coandrel effect, stack effect. So now our firefighters are talking a different language. They understand what's happening in these buildings. So we've changed the culture. Attack hydrants, feed hydrants. What does that mean? How is a building expected to perform when you turn up at this building? What, what are the fire systems going to do? What does it mean when the building's under 25 metres of height? They now understand that there's not going to be a sprinkler system in that building. And these are three of the buildings that we actually walk them through. So this particular one here, um, that building known as Riparian Plaza and 111 Eagle Street. They're all about 10 years apart in age 
and very differing fire systems. So it's quite an eye-opener for the firefighters to actually see the differences and to throw that into turning up at two in the morning, would you be able to use that fire system and understand it? And you can see that that's the hydrant systems and sprinkler booster connection points. Once again, very different systems. And it's quite an eye-opener when they actually walk through and see how they operate. Um, stairwell, um, the air handling system in the building. How do you walk into a fire control room and even know what that air handling system is going to do? Very difficult. So very quickly, um, I'm conscious of time. So high-rise procedures in Queensland, very similar to the UK. We have very much a focus on establishing a bridgehead um, two floors below the fire. So it's a, quite a common setup. But I just want to quickly um, show you this system with an attack pack, which has been very well received. Our GWN radios, so we have a, um, it's almost $1 billion we've just spent on radios across our state, which is quite comprehensive for the police, ambulance and fire service. I can now talk on a radio in the basement of a building. It's a fantastic system, but obviously we've had to pay a lot of money for it. Local action plans. We use a system for the incident control called AIMS, Australasian Interagency Incident Management System, and I'll quickly show you that. Um, so that's our local action plan that's carried on every truck. So the trucks can actually already have some sort of identification of what's in that building. This is the system called AIMS, and predominantly it's based around an incident controller, a planning officer, a logistics officer, and an operations officer. And as that incident escalates, you can see that obviously then there's a whole range of extra positions. But initially, for a smaller job, that particular, um, those roles can be form performed by one person but as it escalates, it's spread out. Very um, successful, we use that across all incidents now and every agency actually speaks the same language. Uh, this is the attack pack I was just talking about and the main thing with this is it's actually designed to deploy in confined areas, so in a stairwell. And you can actually lift that hose up, angle the hose up so that you can actually still move up and down through the stairs. So that's a really, and it's designed to deploy easily. So it's a really good system. If you don't have something like that, I'd highly encourage you to have a look at that type of system. We've been using that only now for 18 months and it's been, um, it's been a good, good setup. So very quickly, the importance of procedures we discussed earlier, reviewing after incidents. So don't just have procedures, we need to actually question them. Are they assisting people or are they relevant are they hinder, or are they hindering people? Do your staff actually know your procedures? I know that when I started, I had this many procedures. Now we have a book of procedures that is phenomenal. I, I don't know anyone in my organisation who can be fully over those procedures. And if, if you ever get stuck, just stick to this very simple flow chart up the top here. Um, very difficult. We have ageing structures around the world, so there is going to be increased incidents in tall buildings. There is a desire to keep building close to amenities, so we're going to have increased high-rise development. Constructing buildings to a minimum standard, so fire systems are not all, always a great selling feature. Environmental efficiency has now become the new sexy thing within the building industry, wanting to know how environmentally efficient is this building. Mixed use. What does mixed use mean in tall buildings? Different occupants. Okay, so we have people that are long term, we have people that are shopping in a building, everybody's going to evacuate in a different way. Ageing populations is a key thing. Okay, how are people going to be able to evacuate out of these buildings? The use of mobile technologies. We now have systems where we can actually send a text message to people within that building. Why wouldn't we use that? Who here doesn't have a mobile phone on them? I would, I would say there would not be one person in this room that doesn't have a mobile phone and increased external fire spread incidents. I just want to quickly touch on the external fire spread. So, very difficult fire event for tall buildings, but they're occurring more often. They're a fast burn, okay? So the fuel load is used up quite quickly in that first one or two minutes, but then we have, depending on what's um, ingressed into the building is the issue that's afterwards. Um, boosting of the sprinkler hydrant system is crucial, and that's what we've found with the event that we had down in Melbourne. Reducing external um, combustible storage is a possibility to look at um, reducing some of that. Identifying which buildings actually have aluminium con um, composite panels so that you can actually have some plans in place for those sort of buildings. Rapid investigation of internal um, fire penetrations. Focus on coordination of your crews. It's a very difficult event to encounter. 
Um, but what you've seen from Australia, we're having a government response now to actually auditing those buildings. And as to what we're going to do with those buildings, it's still unknown. But there is potential. Wall wetting sprinkler systems could be required to be retrofitted. They could be required to actually remove some of these um, wall wetting sprinkler systems. Thank you for your time. I've run out of time, but I'm happy to discuss later on or over morning tea. Thank you.